Hello. Welcome to Agriculture in Wartime, a discussion of Ukraine's agriculture sector and, in, and, and its importance to Ukraine and the world. I'm Caitlin Welsh, director of the CSIS Global Food Security Program. Ukraine's agriculture sector is among the most productive in the world. Ukraine exports much of the wheat, maize, barley, sunflower oil, and other commodities on which many countries around the world rely. Agriculture is also set central to Ukraine's economy, making up about 10% of its GDP. For these reasons, agriculture in Ukraine was an early target in Russia's war. Russia has systematically attacked all aspects of Ukraine's agriculture sector, resulting in reduced supplies and higher prices worldwide, and damage across Ukraine that will take time and billions of dollars to repair. The CSIS Global Food Security Program has made these issues central to our work this year. We've been honored to feature officials from Ukraine's Ministry of Agrarian Policy and Food in our programming. We've analyzed satellite imagery of Russia's damage to Ukraine's farms and agricultural infrastructure, among many other engagements meant to bring light to the damage Russia has wrought and its consequences. Today, we are honored to feature several people with intimate knowledge of agriculture in Ukraine. Case Hausinga, known to many as a Dutch farmer in Ukraine, and winner of the 2022 Kleckner Award for Global Farm Leadership, as well as Dr. Antonino, Antonino Broyaka, who is a former dean at Vinitsa National Agrarian University in Ukraine, and presently an agricultural economist at Kansas State University here in the U.S. Keith is vis visiting Washington from Ukraine, and Dr. Broyaka is joining us remotely from Manhattan, Kansas. From these two guests, we will hear first-person accounts of the impacts of Russia's war on Ukraine's agriculture, what this means for Ukraine and the world, challenges that lie ahead for Ukraine, and reasons for hope. And last but certainly not, not least, I'm very honored to be joined by Mark Zimakovsky, Deputy Ad Assistant to the Administrator in the Bureau for Europe and Eurasia at USAID, to, to talk to us about USAID's Agri-Ukraine Initiative, as well as the importance of the Black Sea Grain Initiative, which is set to expire in a few days. Following my conversation with our panelists, I will welcome questions from the audience. Whether you're watching in person or online, we ask you to please submit your questions at the Ask Questions Here button on our event page. So without further ado, I'm very pleased to turn to, again, doc uh, doctor, to <laughs> farmer, farmer. <laughs> <laughs> Case Hausinger, who is, again, known on Twitter as a Dutch farmer in Ukraine, and he's the 2022 awardee of the Kleckner Award for Global Farm, Farm Leadership. Case, thank you so much for joining us in studio at CSIS. Thank you for having me. Um, so you've been farming uh, for over 20 years in Ukraine, um, a very productive farm. I want to back up, though. Um, you, you're a Dutch national. Why is it that you chose Ukraine as your second home? Farming. Okay. I mean, <laughs> it's as simple as it is. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, I think more than half of the Ukrainian fields were not worked on. They were overgrown with, uh, with wheat. And um, you, know, you could stay in a huge field so of, of several hundred acres per field. So you could start farming there very efficiently, uh, relatively cheaply, mm -hmm. um, because out of the Soviet Union, uh, it only declined. Um, yeah, and I have two partners who already had this experience in Eastern Germany, and okay. together uh, we went to Ukraine and make use of the opportunity. Great. Paint a picture for us. Your farm is about 200 kilometers south of Kiev, is that right? Yeah. Okay, uh, good. Roughly halfway Kiev, Odessa. Oh, okay, okay. Um, and what do you do on your farm? We grow winter wheat, winter barley, winter canola. Uh, sugar beets, sunflower, corn, uh, soybeans, okay. and uh, dairy. We have two two thousand head dairy, and vegetables, onions and carrots with drip irrigation, um, and in total three hundred people, three hundred fifty people working for us. Wow! So uh, yeah, we're a, a big uh, employer in the area. Okay. And uh, and then that's also part of our uh, strategy, you know, to to provide jobs to the people to. Uh, for, for the rural, rural areas to, to develop. Certainly, so. certainly. Um, so you, um, you started farming in Ukraine about 20 years ago. I'm certain you increased productivity over that time. And then bring us to February and March of this year. What happened immediately upon Russia's invasion? Yeah, so o over the last 20 years, Ukraine has quadrupled its agricultural output. And all the logistics and everything has grown with it. It was a steady way up. Um, I mean, it's still, it was still chaotic or so, of course, because it's, you know, it's Ukraine, but it was steadily going forward and was kind of a democracy by default. And then all of a sudden, 24th of February, I, my wife was in the airport in uh, Kiev. She was going to, to fly to the Netherlands for a few days, and she called me at 4 o'clock in the morning and said, uh, airplanes don't fly. Mm. 
uh, we were laughing a bit and said, well, come back home then. And then another friend of mine who was at an, uh, close to an airport on the other side of Kiev says, they're dropping bombs on Borispol. And then, of course, the <laughs> panic, uh, and you immediately get this feeling of war, which I don't recommend to anybody. And uh, I called my wife again and said, get the, out of mm -hmm. that airport because they're bombing, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and she left immediately as one of the first to leave Kiev. And when she came back to the, when she was driving on the highway to, towards the farm, she, was, she saw the bombs dropping left and right of the highway, the, the explosions. Yeah, and it was all very emotional, of course, and very, very scary. Uh, and then towards the end of that day, we decided, so she came home safely, and towards mm -hmm. the end of the day, we decided that she'd leave with the kids um, by car to Romania. Um, and then that same morning, I heard a cruise missile flying over the farm, which uh, bombed um, ammunition depot of the Ukrainian mm -hmm. army, mm -hmm. like 20 miles from our place. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, and then it's just panic, you know, you don't know what to do. I mean, where the bombs drop, do, yep. uh, how many the bombs they throw. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, you know, if you think about it again, uh, it gets emotional again. Yeah. But, yes. but, yeah. but yeah, after... Uh, after a few months, after a few weeks, uh, you, you get used to it. Yeah. So now we're used to it. And, uh, and this morning, I got again some videos from friends in Kiev that there were civilian houses bombed again. So uh, mm -hmm. it's not stopped yet. Um, y y y operations on your farm. Um, uh, were you able to, um, to harvest the crops that were in the ground? Um, your winter crops, were you able to plant this year? W what did operations look like? Yeah, so we are on our on our farm. We're very lucky mm -hmm. because we don't have uh, the experience like the the guys, the people who have in in Mariupol, for example, or Bucha, mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. or the east of Ukraine. Um, yeah. So and and for the, for last season, so the season which is now finishing, everything was more or less prepared. I mean, mm -hmm. that's what farm, farmers mm -hmm. do. They start preparing already the next season as soon as the the, the season before f ends. So. We had a lot of fertilizer already on stock and, and fuel mm -hmm. and crop protection, uh, seeds. Um, and um, so for us, it was not, I mean, it was a panic. Of course, we, we, we bought some ad additional diesel, for example, diesel mm -hmm. fuel. Um, but we, we managed to do everything in a more or less uh, normal way. Mm -hmm. um, and the yields for average, so, but that's weather-wise. So, uh, mm -hmm. But, but yeah, the guys in the east and in, 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 in the north, they have been bombed. They lost everything. Their dairy farms completely destroyed with dead cows all over the place. Mm -hmm. the big farms with dead pigs all over the place. Silos with, with grain in it damaged. Fields full of mines. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those guys are really unlucky. Which are all things that you were, um, were showing the world through your Twitter account. Um, you, you, you started this not long after the war, the, the war started. Tell us why you did this and some of the things that you were, that you were showing the world. I don't know why I did it. <laughs> it just happened, I, I guess, and I wanted to, the world to know. Um, and I've always known and felt that, I mean, that Ukraine needs the Black Sea to export their, uh, their products of the agricultural products, uh, like 70, 75% of what we produce is exported through, mm -hmm. out of the country and out of this 90% through the Black Sea. Mm -hmm. yeah, so if that all stops, you know, then everything stops and then our farm stops. So it's partly self-interest, but also partly, I've, I mean, mm -hmm. I've been living there for 20 years, so mm -hmm. love for the country, for the people, for the 300, our 350 employees, mm -hmm. you know, that this, uh, that this has to stop. So that's, that's the reason. And, uh, I'm not necessarily liking it, but uh, no, but I keep on doing yeah. it. So, uh, yeah. good. Well, thank you for for the important service you're doing for for your country, um, and and for the rest of the world. Um, good, and, and happy to turn back to you for uh, for a few more questions in a few mo moments. Um, right now, very pleased to turn to Dr. Antonina Broyaka, who, as I mentioned, uh, was a dean with um, at the Vinitsa National Agrarian University in Ukraine and is now with Kansas State University in Manhattan, Kansas, known to many as the little, the little apple. <laughs> um, and Antonina, again, thank you very much for making time to join us this morning. Before we start, tell us, how did you end up in Kansas? I have a long story with Kansas State University. I've been to Kansas State at 2000, 
uh, for 2005 academic year under Fulbright Scholarship. And we established nice relationship uh, between KSU and my university in Ukraine and the delegations from K-State several times visited my university, delegation from my university vis visited K-State, so I knew people. <laughs> and unfortunately, after the war broke out into Ukraine, I started receiving many messages from my good friends in Kansas with proposal to help. And of course, nobody thought about that this war will take so long and um, yeah. We were expecting that it will uh, will be over pretty soon, but after spending several days in a shelter, and when the key was occupied, uh, me with my husband decided that I need to go abroad and keep our children in a safe place. So first we we, we went to Poland. We walked uh, through the Polish border. It actually took us two days to get to Poland. And um, we hoped to return, but the situation didn't get better. So we flew to the U.S. and my my friends here in Kansas State helped me, and I've been employed here. So and now I try to be useful as much as possible, both uh, for my country in Ukraine and also for uh, the U.S to understand what is going on, because now it's not only about Ukraine, this is a world problem uh, regarding food security. So sure. this needs to be solved. Good, thank you. Thank you so much, Antonia. Um, uh, in, in Ukraine, you are a very prolific agricultural economist. Um, can you help us put um, put cases experience into context? Um, let's talk about the importance of Ukraine's agriculture sector to Ukraine's economy first. Um, Agricultural sector is one of Ukrainian's economic drivers. It had uh, sustainably grown before the beginning of the full-scale war, showing five to six percent annual growth, with a share of agricultural production in GDP amounting to 10.7 uh, percent uh, last year, and taken together with processing uh, of agricultural products up to 16 percent. So Ukraine was one of the leader of world agricultural producers, ensuring a trade equivalent of 6% of global calorie consumption. Ukraine was feeding 400 million people around the world per year. That's a lot. In 2021, Ukraine was a um, world leader in sunflower oil export with a share of 46%. Third in the rating in, uh, of rapeseed and barley export with a share 13% each. Fifth in wheat export with share 10%. And uh, Ukrainian agricultural export in 2021 amounted more than 27 billion, of which is 41% of its total export. So as you can see, Ukrainian agriculture is really important not only for Ukraine, but also for the world. For the world, yeah. And, and coming back to one point that Case had made um, uh, about his farm being a major employer in, in his region, um, agriculture also is a, across the country, um, significant proportion of the population is engaged in, in agriculture. Um, is that right? Yes, it's true. Yeah. Many uh, people involved in agriculture. Yeah. Um, thank you. So let's um, quantify the impacts of Russia's in invasion um, on Ukraine's production and also its exports. What have we seen so far this year? Um, unfortunately, Russian invasion brought to Ukraine huge damage, and especially in agriculture sector and indirect losses to, together with direct losses in agri uh, Ukrainian agriculture due to invasion uh, reached now uh, up to 40, uh, I'm sorry, 34.25 billion dollars, mm -hmm. uh, including uh, decrease in agricultural crop production, 14.2 uh, billion dollars, disruption in logistic and lower prices uh, for export oriented goods, uh, up to 18.5 billion dollars, decrease in livestock production, uh, more than uh, 348 uh, million dollars, uh, etc. So we lost uh, cultivated area in over 
25%. The loss of irrigation land is over 70%. Uh, the loss of berry fields is around 25%. Uh, the loss of orchards is uh, 20%. And um, due to physical uh, destruction of agricultural enterprises uh, in the um, uh, military zone, um, we uh, ex expected potential loss of livestock up to 30%. And unfortunately, the most significant drop is estimated in 2022 harvest is for barley. Uh, it's around 38.8% mm -hmm. for wheat, 33.3%, sunflower, uh, 31%. Uh, since uh, a sustainable, uh, substantial share of these crops um, is produced in the area uh, directly affected by the war. Um, a relatively less uh, decrease uh, is uh, we expected for corn is around 18 uh, percent because the corn was uh, located more in the central part of the country. Okay. Uh, but unfortunately, due to the uh, blockade of the ports, and as you know, uh, now we are talking a lot about this agreement, grain agreement. Um, uh, but still, those three ports that are open, it's not enough to mm -hmm. uh, uh, you use all yes. our export potential. Uh, for the period of the war, uh, through all ports in Ukraine, including the new ports, uh, we exported uh, around 17 million tons totally of mm -hmm. grain. And before the war, our total capacity was six, seven million tons per month, mm -hmm. up to eight million tons. Yeah, so yeah. We still don't even closer Certainly, certainly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I, I will come back to um, to talk about the Black Sea Green Initiative. One more question from you, uh, for you, Antonina, um, before I turn to, to Mark, um, um, is about rebuilding. Um, you have explained and, and helped quantify impacts of Russia's destruction, again, across Ukraine's agriculture sector, um, systematic attacks, system-wide attacks. What What are the most important first steps, if you could um, give advice to policymakers, what are the person, uh, most important first things that can be done to help rebuild? There are many things that need to be uh, done first, you know, and it's hard to uh, see, say that that is more important yes, than certainly. another. But first of all, uh, large agricultural areas are not suitable uh, for cultivation due to physical damage and mine pollution. Uh, Seraphora demining is a priority task for safe harvesting and sowing for farmers because that is their life. Um, another key task is restoration of critical infrastructure and logistics. Uh, you know that 40% uh, of our power, power plants were bombed and it's mean uh, no electricity, uh, the water doesn't come to houses, mm -hmm. etc. A uh, 6.5 thousand kilometers of uh, railroads, 25 thousand kilometers of roads, more than 300 bridges were destroyed, and it's not directly, you know, di only about agriculture related to agriculture, but in general to uh, uh, renew logistics. Um, another hot question is grain storage facilities. We lost at least 13 million tons of elevators capacities. Mm -hmm. And those storages that are available are so filled with the grain from the previous year that we still try to uh, move out the country. So it is very important to provide farmers with plastic storage bags, with portable elevators, mm -hmm. rings, and uh, maybe in a year building, because it will take time to build new elevators, especially closer to the border with EU country, because if uh, Black Sea agreement will not um, extend it. We need to find uh, another alternative roads. Okay. Um, another perspective uh, task is incre for increasing export capacity. It's using the new Priva course, but it's need to be implemented the deep sea navigation project, including dredging in, uh, of the river port. Sure. Th thank you, uh, Antonina. We, we'll, we'll turn back to that when we talk about uh, the Black Sea Grain Initiative and other um, importance of increasing export capacity. So thank you very much. We look forward to turning, turning back to you in a few minutes. Um, and right now, I'm uh, very pleased to turn to Mark Simakovsky, who's DAA in the Bureau for Europe and Eurasia at USAID. Mark, thanks for joining us here at CSIS. Um, 
I'd like to talk to you first about USAID's efforts to address all of the challenges that Case and Antonina have, have laid out, um, particularly through the Agri-Ukraine initiative that Administrator Power launched in July. Can you tell us about the main elements of the initiative? Absolutely. And, you know, thank you for our guests. I think they've given us a very sobering picture of the devastation wrought by Russia's invasion. And this picture really informed USAID's approach to how to support and develop uh, the agricultural section in the midst of the conflict. And back in the spring, USAID really took a responsive and holistic look at how we can try to help Ukraine and the Ukrainian agricultural sector manage and navigate its way through this very challenging situation. And what we did first and foremost is listen to voices on the ground, listen to Ukrainians, Ukrainian farmers, the Ukrainian uh, agricultural sector, uh, credit banks, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture, to try to get a more responsive set of solutions that would be responsive to Ukrainian needs and responsive to a very fluid situation on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so what we developed essentially in partnership with our Ukrainian uh, partners was uh, a set of four interventions. And again, USAID has been conducting work in Ukraine uh, for 30 years. We have an existing agricultural program, but our challenge was how can we shape our interventions in a way that we're responsive to the current conflict. So what we did was we established a new initiative called Agri-Ukraine, mm -hmm. Agricultural Resilience Initiative Ukraine, mm -hmm. which would be focused on four main lines of effort to support a $100 million commitment of USAID and USG resources. And that would be broken out into four main areas, much of the focus areas that were described today. So first is providing credit to farmers. Because of the conflict, farmers were having an incredibly difficult time accessing credit. Everything uh, from uh, inputs were going up, fuel prices were going up. So partners, were, uh, farmers really needed to be convinced of the utility of planting for the next season, considering these challenges. So mm -hmm. increasing the ability and the access of farmers to have credit that would help them plant. The second key area of focus would be supporting inputs to farmers, so mm -hmm. seeds, fertilizers. Again, the cost of those area, uh, elements have gone up dramatically. So USAID purposely chose an area where we thought we could help farmers access some of the key inputs that would, that would create the uh, ability for them to plant. Mm -hmm. The third clearly was on infrastructure. Um, as we've described, Russia's devastation of uh, the country has really made it very challenging for Ukrainian infrastructure to manage and respond in a way to allow uh, the Ukrainian farmers to export. When we developed this initiative in the spring, we were also facing a Black Sea blockade. Mm -hmm. So in an, in an unprecedented situation for thousands of years, Ukrainian farmers have been able to export through the Black Sea. And overnight, that ended. Mm -hmm. And so the infrastructure routes heading westward to uh, and through U EU borders, we're just not physically capable of managing not only the flow of agricultural products, but also the flow of millions of Ukrainians that mm -hmm. were heading westward. Mm -hmm. So we've been trying to very specifically focus through our own interventions inside Ukraine and to do it in a way that was married with the EU's own efforts outside of Ukraine. So there's been an incredible effort of among the EU to establish solidarity lanes mm -hmm. uh, that have helped facilitate the export of about 15 million metric tons of Ukrainian agricultural products westward through land uh, and uh, water routes, you know, through Poland, through Romania, uh, through uh, Slovakia and other areas. So we're helping essentially marry the routes inside Ukraine mm. with those that the EU is facilitating outside Ukraine. Okay. And then lastly, our interventions have been focused on uh, drying and storage. Mm -hmm. Storage, again, is something that many focused on uh, in the beginning of the crisis as one of the main areas. We understood that that was a focus area that we need to uh, focus some key areas and resources mm -hmm. on, but it was not the only. And luckily, as a result of the Black Sea, some of the needs for storage have declined, but there still was about a 15 million metric ton gap in storage. So some of USAID interventions have been successfully able to uh, focus on those storage needs. Okay, thank you. And what are some of the achievements that you've seen to date under Agri-Ukraine? So, you know, I think in the last few months, we've started to see after the announcement of the initiative in July, some real concrete and tangible progress. So one on uh, the scope of our interventions. Mm -hmm. We've accessed about 12,800 farmers 
and have been able to provide them seeds, fertilizer, crop protection, services, helping about 27% uh, of the country's farmers. Again, about a quarter, uh, so we hope to reach more. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we've made a real impact in touching mostly small and medium-sized mm -hmm. farmers. Second, we have launched a program to provide over 1.7 million metric tons of storage capacity to small and medium enterprises that will serve over 2,000 Ukrainian farmers, helping to close this 15 million metric ton of storage. Third, we've helped expand the access to credit for farmers. And so this has helped enable over 475 farmers uh, achieve the ability to get about 40 million in state mm -hmm. loans and grants by supporting the development uh, of things like digital finance apps um, and leveraging 100,000 in private donations from U.S. credit financial uh, um, unions to help 719 farmers repay loan repayments. Mm -hmm. And we've also provided $800,000 in loan repayments from a liquidity uh, fund in cooperation with the government. We're also helping businesses on the ground relocate uh, in, in spite of the war, particularly some of the most hard hit businesses. We've also recently launched a rail capacity expansion pilot. So we're looking at key areas, particularly along the border, where USAID assistance can help spur uh, some of the multimodal functions of Ukrainian uh, mm -hmm. rail. Again, the rail gauges don't match the ones that are mm -hmm. in Ukraine. So there are some things we can do to help Ukrainian export, particularly at some of these key nodes. And we're also looking to improve equipment and facility at some of these key nodes. So we're seeing some progress. There's still a lot of work uh, that can and should be done. Um, but so far, we've been happy with our interventions and we're constantly shifting to meet needs on the ground. Great, fantastic. Um, uh, the needs are enormous. Um, billions of dollars, significant amount of time to address the needs that we've heard. Very laudable job addressing those needs. Um, but a, it, it can't be USA the only um, in, in support of Ukraine. Who else do we need, need at the table? So you're absolutely right. And the challenge, of course, is the scale uh, is so significant that the U.S. government and even our international partners can't do it alone. So mm -hmm. USAID has essentially targeted a hundred million dollar effort. Uh, we set a goal ourselves to try to spur 150 million of external mm -hmm. assistance. Um, we're very happy uh, that uh, Bayer, a private sector company, mm -hmm. has recently announced uh, the willingness to invest in a 35 million euro seed manufacturing facility in mm -hmm. Ukraine. So for us, that's an incredible example of how the private sector can take the lead mm -hmm. in enabling uh, interventions that are also make business sense. So there's an incredible scope of private sector engagement in Ukraine that pre-existed the war. Uh, and so we think companies can play a significant role. Mm -hmm. uh, other bilateral partners, so mm -hmm. Japan, uh, Canada, the UK, Australia, yeah. have all made important contributions to uh, storage uh, and infrastructure and other interventions along the lines uh, that I've described. Uh, and foundations, foundations mm -hmm. like the Howard Buffett Foundation um, uh, have made important contributions to Ukraine's sector. So what we're looking for is, is partners. We have mm -hmm. a whole range of interventions uh, that we would like to highlight uh, and co-brand uh, with other partners around the world. Uh, the Foreign Agricultural Service has also made a very deep commitment to supporting Ukraine's agricultural mm -hmm. needs. So, um, you know, we have hit the road over mm -hmm. the last few weeks and months, um, and we're looking to continue to find ways to support the sector because it can't be done alone and it surely can't be done solely with the USG. And, yeah. and also we're, we're looking to continue to learn from others like, like Case um, and the professor of how we can be most effective in, in, our, in, a, in our interventions because Ukrainian farmers need the assistance. You're hearing it here, and we think it's our responsibility to help the sector thrive, particularly mm -hmm. to spur the kind of uh, economic growth in Ukraine that mm -hmm. will allow the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian economy to stand up on its own feet and be self-reliant mm -hmm. and, and less reliant on the international assistance that mm -hmm. the U.S. government and others are providing at this yeah. critical time. Thank you, Mark. Um, look forward to um, to following Agri Ukraine and your successes. Um, so th thank you, thank you for uh, for being with us to uh, explain this to our audience. I'd like to turn back to Case and Antonia, and then back to you, Mark, um, to build on some comments that you've made about export. Um, Case, you were saying that you knew from your own experience that you needed the Black Sea 
um, for export of, of grains. Um, Antonina, you had been talking a bit about the Black Sea Grain Initiative. Can we come back to that? Um, what what has been your experience of um, since the initiative was was uh, was put in place? So it was signed in July. Ships started leaving uh, Ukrainian ports again in August. What? Um, how did you experience that in Ukraine? Um, yeah. So we we sold most of our crop before the war uh, started. We we only had five thousand tons of corn left in our silos. And normally through the Black Sea, that would have taken a week to export. Mm -hmm. And we ma mainly brought it by truck to Romania, mm -hmm. and it took us four months. So, um, and then the Black, the, so that's a disaster, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the, bl this, uh, the Black Sea uh, corridor came, and that was really uh, a relief for us. We were able to manage, uh, we, were, we were able to export all of our wheat, all of our barley, and all of our uh, canola. Uh, in part of our sunflower, um, mm -hmm. so yeah, that, <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. that, that 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 helped us. Uh, mm -hmm. That helped us saving storage. That's created li liquidity. Mm -hmm. uh, but we are relatively close to Odessa. Mm -hmm. It's only like 200 miles or 300 kilometers. Mm -hmm. uh, the farmers who are far in the in the far northeast, mm -hmm. uh, they yeah, their logistics costs have risen incredibly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, ours to, to Odessa have doubled, and theirs, uh, I think, more than doubled. Mm -hmm. uh, and plus, nobody really wants to drive there or, or to the east, for example. The farmers in the Donbass area, they had, paradoxically enough, very good yields because mm -hmm. the weather was very favorable. But uh, yeah, there's mm -hmm. still the risk of driving there and getting the grain out yeah. is just higher. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, but it has been very good, and then of course we were in shock again when Russia stopped it, uh, mm -hmm. all on false. I mean, they were <laughs> when we bomb. I don't know what Ukraine bombed something, some mm -hmm. war, some war objects, you know, and then said, Russia said, "Oh, we stopped the grain deal," you know, and mm -hmm. but in the meantime, Russia was hitting civilian mm -hmm. infrastructure. So, mm -hmm. uh, but luckily they rethought their decision, and within a few days they came back. So I have good hopes that after the 19th of. Uh, of November, mm -hmm. we will um, expand this, uh, this corridor. Thank you. Very important de de deadline coming up. Um, Antonina, can you talk to us both about the successes of the of the initiative, um, and also how the initiative itself is not enough? That it's not you know just having these three ports open is not going to be enough to restore Ukraine to its pre-war export capacity. Can you talk to us about both these things? Yes, of course. Um, it is really important for us to continue this uh, initiative in order to move as much as possible of our commodities and other agricultural products out of the Ukraine and feed um, other countries, especially who is import dependent from us. Uh, but also, um, it's not enough, right? Uh, and I'm glad that this uh, in, uh, project that uh, Mark was talking about, the Agri-Ukraine, uh, concentrated not only on a uh, few points, but spread their attention to different aspects, including railway roads and uh, roads and mm -hmm. uh, other uh, aspects. So um, talking about um, grain initiative, um, I would like that the people uh, like the world would understand that it, it cannot be like a Russian game if I want to open this gauge, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. vessels are going and if I don't want to, I just shut it down and that's it. So Russia cannot use this initiative like uh, mm -hmm. uh, to blackmail the world, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. um, and uh, this is an uh, important issue. Another what I would like to emphasize that um, not only in terms of uh, Black Sea Initiative, but rebuilding um, in general, rebuilding the agricultural sector uh, in Ukraine post-conflict, um, it is important to understand that it is not enough just to rebuild what was damaged. Hmm. Technologies, facilities, equipment, supply chain need to be modernized. Uh, in order to ensure our uh, future competitiveness in a world market. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be like a complex of all, you know, um, mm -hmm. all yeah. things. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe it's borrowing a phrase that's been popular here in, in the U.S., but built to build back better. Maybe that's that that would describe what your, your hopes are for Ukraine's agriculture sector. 
Um, I, on the Black Sea Green Initiative, Mark, I'd actually like to turn to you. What are your messages um, for Russia and for the world um, about the initiative, which is set to expire on Saturday, November, November 19th? Um, right now, G20s are, G20 leaders are meeting in Indonesia, and food security is a top agenda item. So what's your message about the initiative and then just to, to about this issue generally? Yeah, this initiative has been critical to food, global food security and, of course, critical to providing Ukrainian farmers the access that they need to not only produce, but also to export, to feed the world. Mm -hmm. And as uh, Antonita has described and Case has described, Ukrainian farmers are critical to the role uh, in terms of feeding hundreds of millions of people around mm -hmm. the world. Uh, and so we feel in the U.S. government that this deal is uh, critical for mm -hmm. global food security. Uh, it's in, obviously, international interests to sustain and facilitate it. Mm -hmm. Russia has agreed to this deal, and Russia should commit and sustain its agreement. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, we have always understood that this deal is fragile, particularly when one party to the deal uh, uh, essentially delayed uh, its opening and then has at various times restricted the ability for ships to get in and out. So mm -hmm. despite Russia's uh, criticism of the deal, uh, all parties understood uh, that Russia was making it difficult to implement. Mm -hmm. But I think and I welcome that all parties uh, have also continued to sustain their participation mm -hmm. um, and have committed to facilitating the deal. Mm -hmm. And I, I, again, laud Turkey's efforts, uh, the UN mm -hmm. uh, and Ukraine. Everyone has an objective and a goal is to ensure mm -hmm. that Ukraine can continue to export. And so that needs to continue. And, and our hope is that it will continue despite Russian threats. Yeah. Um, I also think it's critical to uh, highlight that what we're doing inside Ukraine will also continue independent of the ability for Ukrainians to export through the Black Sea route. We know that there is a party that could try to intervene and stop that. Mm. And again, reflecting what Antonina said, everything that USAID is doing is to support the Ukrainian agriculture sector, uh, not only uh, export in the immediate need, but to mm -hmm. modernize mm -hmm. and to integrate into the EU and EU institutions. So the investments that we're making inside Ukraine now we think are very beneficial because mm -hmm. they're going to help Ukraine uh, be a stronger economy and invest and spur development. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, USAID has a full range of interventions to support the Ukrainian energy sector, to support mm -hmm. good governance, to support longer term land reform, mm -hmm. to support anti-corruption. Uh, mm -hmm. All areas we think are critical in helping Ukraine modernize uh, in spite of this conflict and to be successful. And of course, the agricultural sector is just so critical in that effort. And this mm -hmm. is why we think it's such an important partner for USAID and the US government. And we're gonna sustain yeah. and find ways to bolster our support for the sector. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, I wanna turn back to, um, to Antonina. You were talking about, again, on the Black Sea Grain Initiative that Russia uh, entered into the agreement, um, you know, pulled out of the agreement, is back in, you know, is sending mixed messages about its intentions for November 19th. Um, tell me about your your thoughts about how Russia is using food as a weapon of war, not in a traditional sense, but in a, a very different sense um, in the war that it's waging in Ukraine. Yeah, unfortunately, one of the goal for the invasion into Ukraine um, for Russia, this was uh, taken um, control under the Black Sea uh, because, you know, that Ukraine has really good uh, territorial uh, te location, geographical location, and uh, we had a lot of ports and uh, it helped us um, to um, export uh, uh, many agricultural products. And uh, of course, Russia wanted to have more power and that was one of the reasons also for war in Georgia, in the next and some areas in Georgia, right, access to the Black Sea. This is one of the reasons for invasion in Ukraine. And in this term, controlling the exit uh, uh, through the Black Sea, uh, Russia would be able to blackmail other countries, uh, interdependent countries, poor countries like African countries, Asian countries, uh, just um, blackmail them with the access to the food mm -hmm. if they will agree to play their dirty games, let's say, right? So they will have that food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And even uh, recently we uh, can observe uh, 
voting in the um, Assembly of United Nations, right, uh, the, uh, regarding um, uh, holding Russia uh, accountable for, for crimes committed and compensating uh, for damages, who voted uh, mm -hmm. no? Only mm -hmm. African and Asian countries accompanied uh, with Iran, mm -hmm. North Korea, right? Mm -hmm. So it means that um, Russia still tried to keep those people dependent mm -hmm. from their decision yeah and that is food security that is not only food security now that is general security mm -hmm. this is about democracy this is about peace this is about world structure who mm -hmm. will get the power mm -hmm. you know yeah that we, is important. yeah um at the g20 summit today um we're seeing that russia is continuing its narrative that the uh, global global food security crisis um is the responsibility of western countries that are sanctioning uh, Russia and uh, and Belarus and 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 not the not its own fault um, uh, for it, it, its attacks across Ukraine. So what, what what's your response to Russia's um, Russia's uh, preferred narrative when it comes to uh, to the global food security crisis? Antonina, in case. I would I would say that um, it's not definitely it's not Ukrainian fault, right? And I think that uh, in this situation, Russia, first of all, is responsible for what is going on in Ukraine and around the world with the full security. And, and they uh, need to uh, pay for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Case, anything to add to um, what, what yeah, you've been hearing? The Russians are very good in manipulating things, you know, and turning things around. I mean, that what, you, what they say, that's just you know, turning the world upside down. I mean, they mm -hmm. they have invaded, they created all these uh, problems. And, you know, uh, what Mark said, we need, what you all said, we need to build back Ukraine better. Mm -hmm. We were going forward, you know, we were going uphill. And um, and Russia is, go, is, is trying to push everything downhill and, and to keep on manipulating the world. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't believe anything, or I wouldn't, and I don't believe, and I recommend everybody not to believe anything the Russians say because it's, it's a lie or a manipulation. Mm -hmm. um, thank you all for this um, incredibly um, rich, informative, difficult, um, but necessary conversation. I'd um, like to turn just for, for some final comments um, from each of you. I'll, I'll turn to Case, then Antonina, Antonina and then Mark. But um, Case, I want to draw on something that you wrote um, upon your, um, your uh, notification of your award that you'll be receiving um, late, later this week. Um, you wrote a piece uh, where you said, I found that the general public along with a lot of politicians and journalists, do not know how agriculture and world commodity trade works. So um, anything you'd like to say, uh, the platform is yours, but, um, but to, to inform the general public about, about this issue and Ukraine's um, role. Yeah, well, the positive thing about this war is that people now start to interest themselves into, into world food supply, you know, and where, uh, mm -hmm. or at least, it's all over the news, so uh, people get a better, uh, a better idea of, of it. But as an example, I talked to a journalist in March uh, when there was still snow on the ground, mm -hmm. and he said, uh, do you also already see a decline in production? And I'm not sure if I understood the question. I said, what do you mean, decline in production? Yeah, so less yields, less whatever. But I said, it's still snowing, there, you know, <laughs> it's still freezing. You haven't even taken out the machines to plant. So what decline in production? You know? mm. and, and yeah, and uh, the Western countries where you spend an average of seven, eight, nine percent of your income on food. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's nothing. You know, everybody will have, uh, mm -hmm. pays hundreds of dollars for iPhones and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and food is just something which is always there. And um, you know, but this shows that it's not always there. Mm -hmm. You know, and especially for the for the poorer countries where you, where people spend 70, 80 percent of their income on food. Mm -hmm. You know, now they have to spend 150 percent of their income on food, so they will have hunger. Yeah. You yeah. know, and and um, yeah, if this if if we get if we let Russia get away with this, uh, that won't stop. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, and, yeah, and that's and that's also farmers who have to communicate communicate better to the people, you know, to the world, to well, to to show what they are doing, and that's what we try with the Global Farmer Network as well. Well, and thank you for your role with that. Um, uh, again, the important service you've been doing since the war started. So thank you, and again, congratulations on your award.
Um, and thanks for joining us here in Washington. Thank you. Um, Antonina, final comments from you? Um, I, I would like to add a few words um, about agri-Ukraine. I know that they work a lot of uh, helping Ukrainian agriculture, but uh, I, I would like to add that uh, one of the important things uh, that is developing of um, irrigation system, right, that I know that uh, that initiative also working on, uh, because as I mentioned, 70% of uh, irrigation system was destroyed and building new irrigation system will help to increase our production and increase our yields in the future. And um, another important thing that uh, will help us um, to um, uh, build our independence is uh, through uh, development of um, bioenergy production. Mm -hmm. uh, because our witness that uh, we are import dependent of and uh, uh, like oil and gas, right? So uh, building, uh, helping us uh, development uh, by energy uh, production and construction of um, the processing plants for agricultural crops and silages to be a gas, that would be really helpful uh, to make Ukrainian economy much more stronger. So right. that would might be another comment <laughs> regarding the Good. Thank you. future Good. economy in Ukraine. Thank you again, um, and thank you for uh, making time to join us um, from Kansas today. Thank you, Antonina. Thank you. Um, and Mark? Yeah, I think we kind of go back to February 24th, and ultimately Russia made a choice. This is a war of choice, and it's a war of aggression. Mm -hmm. And what's happening to Ukraine's agricultural sector, which is a civilian sector, mm -hmm. it's people getting up every single day, uh, to plant crops like millions of Americans do here in the United States and are looking up and they're watching their crops, their uh, livestock purposefully being destroyed mm -hmm. by Russian mm -hmm. military infrastructure. And this is happening on a day-to-day -day basis. And to, to me, it showcases the face of the Russian war machine mm -hmm. that Russia is purposely choosing to destroy Ukrainians' ability to have their normal livelihood that livelihood is contributing to the ability of hundreds of millions of people, 400 million people, mm -hmm. uh, and their food needs. Mm -hmm. And so as a result of Russia's war of aggression, which has been a war of choice mm -hmm. uh, that the Ukrainians did not want and did not do anything to facilitate, uh, there are high increased food prices mm -hmm. all over the world in mm -hmm. uh, food and secure places like Yemen and Ethiopia. Uh, and also on American shelves, mm -hmm. we're all paying more. Mm -hmm. So Ukraine's ability, Ukraine's ability to export, uh, just like any other country, uh, is, is a right. And it's something that I think will contribute to global food security. Mm -hmm. So I think it's in the U.S. national interest to support that right and to mm -hmm. support that capability. Uh, and it also will help Ukraine integrate westward, will help it become a normal country, uh, like so many other countries in, in Europe. One of the positive consequences of this devastation is Ukraine has had to accelerate its integration with its neighbors mm -hmm. uh, through road and through rail. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a positive. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to continue to work on that. And, and of course, the investments that we make, even though they may seem significant, are investments that I think will ultimately contribute to U.S. interests and to contribute to global food security mm -hmm. um, and will redouble uh, our own interests in terms of strengthening Ukraine's ability to integrate westward uh, which is a U.S. interest. Great. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. It's a per perfect place to conclude our conversation. So I'd like to thank you, thank Case and Antonina for joining me today. Thank you for joining us in person and online. Um, I'd like to thank uh, CSI's External Relations, the Global Food Security Program, and the Project on Prosperity and Development for your support, and you, our audience, online and in person for joining us today. This concludes our event. Thank you again for joining, and you can please follow us on Twitter at CSISfood.